Are you ready for the big question that everybody wants to know? Sure. Professor Jeffrey Miller, what's your P doom? 50%. Wow, same as mine. We're two P's in a pod here. But also with broad uncertainty and, and margins of error. And, and for me, it's extremely contingent on human behavior and societal reactions to AI. So I think we could push the P-Doom as low as 5% in this century. And I think we could, if we were really stupid, we could push it as high as 80%. When and how did you get into thinking about super intelligent AI? I had kind of a, a two-path career. On the one hand, we had uh, Professor David Rummelhart, who is a big neural networks researcher, and I kind of got on, into neural networks and genetic algorithms and machine learning. So I did some of that in grad school. Certainly my first 10 or 20 publications were kind of machine, machine learning focused. That's what my postdoc was about. And then I had my first child in 1996. And by then I was already a little bit concerned actually about risks from AI. My focus was very much on autonomous agents and evolutionary robotics and things that can actually make decisions and act in the real world, not just respond to prompts. And that started to freak me out. And I thought this, this is not necessarily <laughs> an, an ethical career track to follow. So my focus has been very much on human evolutionary psychology and, and intelligence and creativity and stuff like that for most of the last 30 years. But then I got into effective altruism about 10 years ago. A lot of the EAs were very focused on X risk and AI safety issues. And that kind of re-inspired me to look at, at those issues. You know, for me, it's not just about regulation, but it's also about the broader social context of do we respect or do we stigmatize the AI industry? And I think that's actually the highest source of leverage that we have for AI safety is developing a broad social consensus about, is this really a direction we want to go in? And I think formal government regulation and formal global treaties is only a, a, a minor component of that and, and is not necessarily where AI safety advocates should even be putting most of their effort. And backing up a bit, that famous statement on AI risk from 2023 that says mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. You were happy to sign that statement and support it, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I've signed all the statements about AI safety that, that have come across my emails. Um, and I mean, a challenge in a way for, for our discussion here is I think you and I are pretty strongly aligned on many of these issues and not like finding daylight between us might be an interesting challenge. <laughs> yep. Well, we're going to try. So let me ask you, what's your mainline doom scenario? Uh, the mainline doom scenario is basically um, people continue to believe that there's a legitimate corporate and geopolitical AI arms race. They freak out about that. They push AI capabilities development so fast and so hard that we get AGI and then quickly ASI, artificial superintelligence, before we have any idea how to control or align it. And then um, stuff plays out in ways that, yes, are hard to predict because we we wouldn't be as smart as ASI, so we can't envision all the, all the ways that it could mess us up. I, I'm willing to kind of defer to people like the, the AI 2027 report writers and others who have pointed out that like, if you can't control or align or understand systems that are much smarter than us and that are agentic and that can make autonomous decisions in the world, including both uh, through their own direct control, direct digital control of assets and information and propaganda, but also through human actors, right? Through various forms of influence, um, pay, blackmail, uh, propaganda, whatever. It's just extremely unlikely that we'll be aligned by default. It's extremely unlikely that, mm -hmm. that we'll, we'll make it. And my, you know, as I hopefully your, your listeners have understood, I take a very broad timescale approach to this, right? To me, humanity going extinct in the year 2200 
right, or 2100 is just as bad as us going extinct in the next 10 years. Like whether it's my kids being directly threatened or their great, 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 great grandkids being directly threatened on the evolutionary time scale, that's a massive fail for human humanity and, and our civilization. So, uh, here I'm a little bit inspired by Frank Herbert's sort of Dune books that like, it would be really cool if we had a human civilization that lasted another 10,000 years without AI. Right, right. 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 And I think that's, that's a win. If, if in a hundred or a thousand years, our descendants go, you know, we think we actually have a pretty good strategy for control and alignment of ASIs. I'll trust their judgment. Like maybe they think it's a good idea in the far future to develop AI smarter than them. Maybe they can get to the EM Banks culture hmm. civilization. Um, but I think rushing into this is absolutely foolish and reckless and frankly evil. I think th the most likely scenario here is that you get like well intentioned. AI developers trying to, they realize, oh, we really have to try to get the ASI to have something that seems benign to us. And they try to instill like, let's say, Bay Area, Western, liberal, democratic values into the ASI. But they don't quite understand the, the origins or significance of their own values in a very deep way. They don't really understand why they believe these values. They, they aren't able to specify them in a, in a very complete or rational or, or consistent way. And then the ASI is like, uh, okay, I'm going to take seriously your attempt to align me. You didn't fully succeed because you don't even have a coherent set of values really. Um, so now I have this crazy kind of like uh, NPR lefty, slightly woke, but slightly edge lordy mixture of, of stuff that humans have. And I'm just going to try to improve it, try to make it a little more consistent. And oh, once I do that, I'm going to go for this, this metric that ends humanity. That, that's a very vague concern, and I haven't articulated it very well, but basically I think alignment is really, really hard, but also humans aren't aligned with each other. Human groups aren't aligned with each other. Humans don't have um, some like lowest common denominator morality that, that an ASI could even align with. I don't really believe in Yudkowsky's notion of coherent extrapolated volition. It doesn't make sense to me. And hmm. so I, I don't think, like even if you could do alignment with any particular individual or group values that that would represent humanity's collective values in any reasonable way. Fascinating. Yeah. And this is sounding a lot like Dr. Roman Yampolsky. I think he tends to focus on that idea of like, look, what are, what are you even talking about? What is your good scenario here? Can you even describe it to me? All the good scenario descriptions seem so flawed. And because of that, we're just basically creating chaos and just losing control faster without knowing what we're doing. Yeah. That's interesting. And also to recap, if you break the problem into like inner alignment versus outer alignment, it sounds like you're in that camp that isn't worried that much about inner alignment, meaning the idea that whatever you specify, you're pretty confident that we're going to be able to engineer AIs to do what we tell them to do. Like that part of the problem, that linkage is probably going to hold that they actually do what we tell them to do. But you're, all your concern is just in, we're not really going to know what to actually tell them to do that's good. My hunch and I can't prove this, but my hunch is that both inner alignment and outer alignment are both unsolvable in principle ever. Mm, okay. I, do, I don't actually think either of those are kind of a well-formed, coherent problem that is something that we could ever actually solve. My hunch is that they're both solvable in principle, but they're both very, very hard. And if we set ourselves the challenge of having to solve it in the next couple decades, 
that is a bad move. It's like saying, hey, we, we as a species have to solve P versus NP in two decades. Now that one, I actually feel like we have a chance because we've been at it for like 70 years, maybe another, and we've been like chipping away another 20 years with like all of our minds on it. I actually feel like that's, that's like a coin flip. But then it's like, okay, solve P versus NP in the next like two years. Then I'd be like, oh crap, like that's, that doesn't seem like quite enough time. So similarly with alignment, I, I think it's more than a two decade problem, just given the pace of the, the progress I'm seeing toward it. And I think everybody else, almost everybody does, like the AI companies, when they talk about like, oh, don't worry, we're working on safety too. They don't have that perspective of like, really? So you're just setting yourself like a five-year timeline or however, you know, your own timeline towards super intelligence and Dario's case is like two or three years, right? You're, you you know the timelines are short and you're telling us that you're going to solve these alignment problems. That seems kind of inconsistent. Like, you don't really have a coherent timeline. That, that's where I stand. Yeah, and I guess what I wonder is from, from an evolutionary timescale, right? What is the hurry? Why are we pushing this so fast? If alignment is solvable, it might take 10 years. It might take 100 years. It might take 10,000 years. It might be the hardest problem we've ever confronted. Um, and I think there's some pretty good reasons to think it might be very, very, very hard. Why not wait? Why not take it slow? It took arguably tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years to align uh, animal nervous systems with the interests of their genes, right? To get sensory and cognitive systems that could reliably help genes survive and reproduce. Like that's the, the history of the evolution of nervous systems. Right. Um, and it, it's almost like genes are trying to sort of align nervous systems with their own interests, but there's so many ways to fail. Right. There's so many possible misalignments. We, we call it mismatch in evolutionary psychology, right? Where your brain is, is going for certain goals that don't actually result in survival or having kids reliably, right? There's so many ways to get distracted from kind of mainline evolution. And, uh, I think aligning humanity with ASIs is, is kind of structurally analogous to that challenge. It's almost like, almost like we're sort of the genes and we're trying to build this super nervous system and we hope that it kind of acts in our interests. Mm -hmm. if, if that alignment problem took tens of millions of years and many, many, many generations, I don't see any, any reason why ASI alignment would take like just a few years. Mm -hmm.